Bruce Lee is recognized as the world's best martial artist. Bruce had many students who were celebrities of the day, including Steve McQueen and James Coburn. Um, he even taught karate champion Chuck Norris, as well as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, known as Lou Alcender when he played for UCLA at the time. One of Bruce's top students was Hollywood screenwriter Sterling Siliphant. Now Sterling said, in my whole life, no man, no woman was ever exciting as Bruce Lee. What is it about Bruce Lee that draws people to him even 40 years after his death? When Bruce was asked if he's really that good, he answered poetically, well, if I say I'm not good, you, you probably think I'm boasting. But if I say I'm no good, you know I'm lying. As a young child growing up in Central California, Bruce Lee was my hero. While I attended college at UC Berkeley, I was given the opportunity of studying Bruce Lee's martial art, known as Jeet Kune Do. In so doing, not only was I able to learn the physical aspects of the martial art, but also Bruce's philosophical approach to martial arts and to life in general. I was very fortunate to be able to learn about both sides, the physical and the mental sides of Bruce's approach to martial arts. In my martial arts journey, I was very fortunate to be able to meet many of Bruce's direct students. My first instructor at UC Berkeley was Greg Lee. Greg Lee was the student, was the son of James Lee. James Lee was a very close associate of Bruce's while Bruce lived in Oakland, California. And, in, and after that, then I was able to meet my Sifu, who I consider my teacher, my father figure. His name was Ted Wong. Ted Wong was one of Bruce's closest students when Bruce lived in Los Angeles, just after he finished doing the Green Hornet TV series. And Ted, my teacher, Sifu Ted, was able to see Bruce evolve his martial arts from, to his latest developments in Los Angeles. In training with my instructor, Ted Wong, I was able to get direct instruction, private instruction from my instructor in his backyard. One-on-one, -on -one, uh, he was molding me, shaping me to become an instructor, which I became in the early 90s. I began teaching in San Francisco while apprenticing under my instructor, and he would visit me in San Francisco and check on my the progress of my teaching of my students in San Francisco. Shortly after that, he certified me as an instructor of Jeet Kune Do. Following that, Linda Lee, Bruce's widow, became concerned about the how the art was being carried on for future generations. And as a result, what she did is she called together all of Bruce's students to try to sift through the confusion that was going on about Bruce's art uh, to the public world. As a result of Linda Lee calling together all of her, all of Bruce's students, she formed what was called the Bruce Lee Educational Foundation, and that comprised of almost all of Bruce's students. I became the organization's unofficial videographer, which meant that I was able to videotape all of Bruce's students while they were instructing their students. Based on my experience learning from all of Bruce's students, I compiled this information and I put it together in a book called Bruce Lee, The Evolution of a Martial Artist. What I aim to do there is to chronicle Bruce's evolution from Seattle to Oakland to Los Angeles, where he lived in the United States, and how his art evolved based on his experiences, based on his research, and, and to illustrate that all of his art from beginning, middle to end is his entire life project in martial arts. In my book, people will find that Bruce was very dedicated to his martial art and to healthy living and to his training. He trained between six and eight hours every day and he realized that that was going to, that was his job, that was going to make him his, his career. And once he realized that that was, that was going to be his life work, he dedicated himself to daily practice, to daily training. Um, he did a lot of research on martial arts and on physical training. He looked to all of the physical training books, textbooks of the day, and he also looked into uh, bodybuilding. His thirst for martial arts forced him to look at various martial arts and to be able to pick the best things from elements from those martial arts and to be able to 
cull those together and to find what was going to work for him. He also looked to the physical training of the day. He wanted to enhance his physical performance of his techniques. He not only looked to uh, physical training, bodybuilding, to what the trainers were doing in the boxing world of the day, but also to the world of science, biomechanics. He was already looking into biomechanics and being able to see what was going to help him perform his techniques to the highest levels. One of the challenges for the fans today is to get past Bruce's physicality. Bruce is such a physical force that somebody has to look beyond that to see what else he had to offer the world, and he has a lot to offer philosophically. In researching Bruce's philosophy, I found that Bruce's approach was a fusion of both Eastern and Western philosophies. Bruce sketched out a miniature tombstone on letterhead, requesting his student to design and to build such an item as this. And this was actually made by the same person who designed this for Bruce. What Bruce was trying to communicate here is the stifling traditions that confine the student and, and restrict their freedom. So what does it say here? In memory of a once fluid man crammed and distorted by the classical mess. What Bruce is trying to say here is tradition is, is fine, but once tradition starts confining your freedom, confining your ability to be able to think outside of the box, Bruce was really against that. So due to tradition or classicalism, the, the student must go beyond that, otherwise they're going to be buried in with all of the traditions stifling their creativity, stifling their growth. Bruce Lee also had some very powerful images to communicate his martial art. This here is his, is his symbol. Um, the Jeet Kune Do symbol is what we refer to it as. And you will notice that it has both the yin and the yang uh, symbol on here, but he also put the arrow to to communicate that the yin and yang is constantly in motion. It's not just fixed in time. It's constantly evolving, constantly moving, and so Bruce put the arrows on here to to continue to emphasize the continuous motion. Now you will notice that he has uh, a ch two Chinese phrases uh, surrounding it, and the two Chinese phrases are. In Chinese, Yi Mo Fat Wei Yao Fat, Yi Mo Han Wei Yao Han. Those, those phrases translate into using no way as way, having no limitation as limitation. What Bruce is trying to communicate here is not that I'm just having no particular way in doing something, it is I am actually going beyond the way. I'm going beyond system. There is really no system. And when you look at the idea of what yin and yang means, it's really neither for or against. It's really the fusion of the two. And that's something that people have to understand philosophically from an Eastern standpoint. In the Western standpoint, you might have uh, uh, black and white or, or this side or that side. But in Eastern philosophy, it is all one. And it is, again, that yin and yang working together. Now, what Bruce is really trying to illustrate here, it's really the fusion of those two uh, statements that work together. Because what he said to his student at one time was, as soon as you have a way, therein lies your limitation. And so what he's trying to illustrate there is that don't get yourself boxed in. Don't, get, don't tell yourself, this is the only way that I will do something. You will constantly be in that process of refinement and continually looking for better ways, more efficient ways of accomplishing something. Also, Bruce wanted to illustrate what he called the three stages of cultivation. This first one here, he's he's illustrating yin and yang separate, 
okay? And this is partiality, the running to extremes. And what Bruce is trying to illustrate here is that yin and yang cannot be separate. That in fact, once you do this, then you do have that dilemma of for or against. In this case here, this is the first stage of, of cultivation that Bruce is trying to illustrate. And Bruce had a very uh, uh, visual way of describing uh, the running to extremes uh, in a screenplay that he wrote. And what he was illustrating was picturing that there's a snowy scene. And in so doing that, you see uh, a, a big oak tree with a big trunk on it with, uh, uh, with a lot of snow on, on it. And what happens is the snow is so heavy that the big branch of the tree cracks and collapses. In the next scene, what Bruce writes is that you have this flexible bamboo that has the snow on it, and in so doing, it, it, the weight of the snow is actually released as soon as the bamboo uh, um, bends enough that it falls down, the snow falls off of it, and as a result, then the bamboo is able to, to uh, flex back upwards. In the second stage of cultivation, Bruce illustrated it with this plaque, which, in, which really is the, his base uh, uh, symbol of the yin and yang fully integrated as well as the arrows uh, illustrating that it's in constant movement. And his title below is Fluidity, the Two Halves of One Whole. What one needs to understand is that yin and yang are not two separate forces. It is one, it is conceived of as, as one, which happens to have two separate forces working together in unison and and that balance may change from time to time but that it's constantly in flux and in motion and in this case but in this case the yin and yang are together in the third and final stage bruce illustrates it with a plaque that has nothing on it and in fact at the bottom it says emptiness the formless form and what bruce is trying to illustrate trying to communicate here now is that now you are beyond uh, the yin and yang and that you have no conflict within you and so now you are you are you are adapting yourself to the situation the formless form is the ultimate in adaptability bruce liked to always say to be like water because water is the the substance that will constantly adapt to its situation and in so doing bruce liked to say when in a teapot it becomes a teapot. When in a cup, it becomes the cup. Water can flow or it can crash. Be like water, my friend. Bruce realized that the one constant in life is that there will always be change. And so Bruce was constantly looking for ways of adapting himself to what he called what is. What is is what is happening in life. Things may go up or may go down, but he will always adapt himself to the situation at hand. With this philosophy, I realized that Bruce was communicating his philosophy through his martial arts, even physically. And that's one thing that most people don't understand about martial arts. Um, many times martial artists today are just going through the physical motions, but Bruce lived and breathed his martial arts not only physically, but mentally and philosophically as well. In my research, one thing I found out about Bruce Lee was that he was a constant reader. In fact, his library comprised of 2,500 books of all sorts of different subjects, including those on martial arts, boxing, fencing, physical training, and philosophy, as well as the self-help books of the day. Bruce would write uh, poems to himself, and these were things coming right out of those books. To, he utilized these to motivate himself and to motivate others. And this method of positive thinking is what really drove Bruce's life in many different ways. It gave him the energy to continue on his honing his martial art, his meeting his friends and associates, and being able to become that martial arts movie star that he became. Over the past few years, I've had the honor of serving on the board of directors for the Bruce Lee Foundation. And our main goal, our main mission is to build the Bruce Lee Action Museum in Seattle, Washington. Now, many people may ask, why Seattle, Washington? Well, you have to understand, that's where Bruce grew up in the United States 
from the time he was 18 to about the time he was 23, and that's where he met his wife, Linda Lee. When Bruce was going through his times in Hollywood and in Hong Kong, he told Linda that at some time they wanted to return to Seattle. So when he passed away untimely in Hong Kong, Linda decided to take Bruce back and to bury him in, in Seattle. And so that's why we want to build the museum in Seattle, Washington. And we're gaining a lot of support from the city, from the uh, various uh, uh, organizations and corporations being willing to build this museum. We affectionately call it BLAM for Bruce Lee Action Museum. In the Bruce Lee Action Museum, we plan to house the Bruce Lee Library, number one, for his 2,500 books that Linda Lee still kept after all these years with all of his notations in the books and his, his notes to himself both in English and Chinese. We would also house his archives, which includes the thousands of pages that he wrote making notes to himself, uh, whether it was martial arts or movie making at the time. And we would also have a museum that would display various items and artifacts that people can be inspired by in seeing what moved Bruce. We would also have a learning center where we would have seminars teaching Bruce's martial art and his philosophy. Uh, we found that Bruce's uh, philosophy has touched lives all around the world and so we want to have a location where people can go to to pay their respects to him and also to continue being inspired to live their lives to their fullest.